I'm studying schizophrenia. And we have known for quite some time now that, especially in the frontal parts of the brain, if you study uh, brains from schizophrenia patients that are deceased, you see few, in general, you see fewer numbers of connections between nerve cells, what we like to call synapses. And the problem has been that we don't really know why that is the case. But what we do need, what we do know is that it's pretty early in development that we actually decide how many synapses we are going to have in the brain. So already here, we actually peak in the numbers, and this is general for all people. The, the most synapses we have in the brain is when we are very young. Then during the teens, what then is happening is that we get rid of synapses. And that process uh, we usually call synaptic pruning. And we believe that the, the reason why we do like this is because the, the, the brain is uh, using this system to improve. It takes away synapses, the problem is not working that good, and then it saves the good ones. But then after 25, around 30 years of age, it's pretty stable. Then we have more or less the same number of synapses until we get really old. And schizophrenia is then usually developing in the late teens when this process is ongoing. A lot of people have thought about this during the years uh, and, and uh, thinking that this process may be involved in schizophrenia, that we actually get a reduction of synapses that is excessive. We take away too many synapses. And approximately 10 years ago, there were some very surprising findings that came from mouse studies in the Beth Stevens lab. They showed that the, the brain immune cells, that we call microglia, they are actually involved in this process. So what they do is more or less the same way they would eat or kill a bacteria, they actually also take away synapses. And for this, they use similar systems. So they use something called the complement signaling system, which is a way of targeting bacteria, or in this case, synapses. So they, somehow, they know how to choose which synapses to take away and which one to spare. And then in 2016, if I remember correctly, there were also uh, a group uh, in Boston, uh, Steve McCarroll Lab, together with also other collaborators, that started looking at the genetics of schizophrenia. And they then studied one of the locus, one of the parts of the genomes that is very strongly associated with schizophrenia. And they could show that this risk factor is actually, to a very large extent, dependent on how many copy numbers, how many repeats you have of a gene that is coding for a complement factor, namely complement factor 4. And to make it even more complicated, in the human genome, there's two variants of this C4. So there's one called A and there's one called B. And this association seems to be very specific to the C4A variant. So the more C4A, the higher risk of schizophrenia. And then, of course, this could be a possible link between the genetics of schizophrenia and synaptic pruning, because we know that the complement system is involved in synaptic pruning. The problem, though, is that it's pretty hard to study, because usually when we want to study mechanism, we go to animals, to mice. And to start with, they probably don't have schizophrenia, but they're also more complicated here because they don't have this C4A gene. Instead, they have just one C4 gene that is a mixture of C4A and B. So it's not really possible to study this type of gene if you don't have the human genome. And we don't really want to go in to study the brain of the living person either, if we're not using imaging and so on. So, so the, only re the only way, more or less, to do that is to take cells from a subject. And you can take, like a skin biopsy, cells that is easy to get, blood cells, and then you can reprogram or transdifferentiate those cells, so you make them into brain cells. And that means you can get some sort of a model of a living person's brain in a dish. And that we started doing uh, approximately 2015. Uh, so we developed a protocol to make microglia, because we wanted to study them in relation to synaptic pruning. And I won't go into all the details here, but more or less the basic idea is that you take blood, you take blood cells, and then you put them in a dish. 
And then you have all the factors there that tells the, the cells that you are actually in the brain. So we kind of like to trick them into believe they are in the brain. And what happens then is that they start looking like microglia. And if you look at specific markers for microglia, they also exp express these very specific markers. And in fact, more recently, uh, one of our collaborators, the Harris Lab at the Karolinska, they took a mouse model, and then they took the same type of cells, and they pushed them into the human brain. And when they compared those ones to microglia, it was more or less in it was more or less impossible to distinguish them from real microglia. So even if it's not microglia, it's something that's really close to microglia. Uh, and we then take these cells, uh, we grow them in a dish, and then we also, from the same subjects, make neurons. And from those neurons, we cut off the synapses, and then we feed the synapses to the microglia. And before we do that, we also dye, we put a dye on the synapses, and this dye is a pH-sensitive dye. So it means that it will just glow when the pH drops. And that's exactly what's happening when the microglia is eating synapses. It comes inside the microglia, and they start to digest it, and the pH drops. So then you can image these models, and then you can see how much of this red dye you get. So all these are four different types of cells that we are following in over time. And then you see at around two hours, all these cells start to get red because they are eating these synaptic structures. And then you can follow them all over time like this. And that we did for, for models from schizophrenia patients. And then we compared that to models from healthy controls. So all together, because this is a relatively cheap way of doing these type of cells. We could do that for more than 30 subjects. And then when we compared, we grouped them into schizophrenia subjects and healthy controls. We saw actually that there were a, quite, there were a larger uptake of synapses in the microglia that we derived from schizophrenia patients. And we then also studied this genetic risk factor. So what you see here in this slide is complement deposition. So the more green you have, the more complement deposition you have on your neurons. And if you then compare different types of models from different types of subjects that have different numbers of this, this gene, then you see that the more number you have of this C4A, the more complements are going to attach to the neurons. And at the same time, we also saw a very similar curve when we looked at uptake. So the more C4A copy numbers you have, the more uptake you're going to have by microglia. So more of synaptic pruning in this model. Uh, then you can also use this model to study drugs. So one of the first drugs that we studied was minocycline, which is an antibiotic. And then we treated these models with antibiotics in different concentrations. And we then saw that the higher concentration you have of minocycling, the lower amount you have of synaptic pruning. So it's a very dose-dependent effect. And then we actually also follow up this data in, in electronic health records. So we looked at around 20,000 patients that were receiving minocycling for acne during their teens, this period where we have a lot of synaptic pruning. And we then compared the ones who got minocycline to other antibiotics, and then we saw that the risk of actually later in life getting schizophrenia was more or less half compared to the ones having other antibiotics than minocycline. So uh, then to sum up the project, uh, so what, what do we really want to do? Well. Uh, we think it's a bit too early to start giving minocycling to patients or to actually start telling the drug companies that they should develop a drug against synaptic pruning because there are still limitations here. The models I was talking about, it's a 2D model, so we don't really know that it's mimicking the brain because it's outside. So we want to make it as close to the brain as possible. And one way of doing that is to make the models in 3D, which we like to call mini-brains. And we have already started doing this, and to be able to do it from many patients, we have developed a way of doing it cheaper and faster. So we have these small bioreactors, sorry, these small bioreactors, 
that is made from 3D material. We do 3D printing, and then we put a motor here with small propellers, and that makes these 3D structures so we can study it from patients. So we're more or less going to do the same type of experiments also on these 3D structures. Uh, and then we also, from the patients that we are deriving these models, we are going to measure the number of synapses in the brain using PET imaging, and at the same time also take a lumbar puncture. So that means we can validate that our models is actually reflecting what's happening inside the brain. And finally, uh, I will not go through the details here, but we will also use a screening system where we actually modulate the genome, and then we look what happens for pruning. So we are trying to find other types of targets for drugs to increase or uh, decrease synaptic pruning. So with that, uh, I would like, of course, to thank uh, the Stagling family and also the One Mind Foundation. Uh, and Kaiser Permanente, and of course all the patients and families that contributed to these studies, as well as the person working in my lab and all collaborators. Thank you so much.